Okay, so today we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Uh, the public preaching and teaching ministry of Jesus is actually concluded by this point in John. And so we've been studying, we'll begin studying John's last nine chapters here. Reading from the New King James Version, we're going to jump in in John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Then Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done for you, done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than him who sent him. Verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Okay, a little incident here. Uh, the timeline of the narrative we're seeing in this, in this chapter slows down tremendously at this point, and it speaks to how important our understanding of these events is. And we've seen all through the Gospel of John the, the timeline of just, to, it recaps long periods of time that we need to understand, and then it focuses our attention and our understanding on some specific items and specific uh, events. For instance, the first five Verses of John, you read that in thousands of years zoom by, all the way from the beginning uh, up to the time where John the baptizer appeared on the scene. Now, does that mean that the beginning of time and the creation of the world and Jesus' part in that creation and uh, you know being creator God and the life and the light that he gives to mankind, that that's not important? It's only worth five verses? Well, no, not, not of course not. Um, but it's all quickly summarized as something that we either already understand, or sometimes we don't really need all those details to believe what Jesus has for us. We know that in the important events of, uh, that happen for, for mankind from God's perspective are also chronicled in the Hebrew scriptures. And the people that John was writing to were already familiar with this. And so now we're seeing in the slowest part of this journey through the gospel that the next seven chapters that we're, we'll be studying, including this one, cover a period of about 24 hours. Seven chapters for 24 hours. And that's because these 24 hours were more important? Well, not exactly. Although they certainly are extremely significant. But it's slower so that we can understand and grasp what's happening here. All the other things that Jesus said and did in his ministry, uh, they, they come to focus on the events here that make all the difference for you and me. In addition, God knows that us understanding these things will help us to comprehend what he's done for us. So we slow down for this understanding and of course digging into the various aspects of creation and exploring our world and some of the histories and, and all these things that God does not detail in his word. It's interesting, many times it's fun, it's fascinating, um, but we've gotta first embrace the things that are more essential 
to our life, to our hope and our salvation. So let's spend our time now on what God feels is most important. Um, that gives, actually gives us a life lesson looking at that, and that is when our time is limited, we should focus on the most relevant issues dealing with our lives and eternity. When our time is limited, we should focus on the most relevant issues dealing with our lives and eternity. So let's jump in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's very clear, very plain. He loved his own so much, he was going to carry out his mission to the very end to bring redemption. Now soon he would tie these things together. A few more chapters, we'll, we'll see him uh, you know, emphasizing greater love has no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friends. And that's up in John 15, 13. But the disciple John found another more personal meaning in this love, as you'll see as the, the text continues here. Verse 2 says, And the supper being ended, let me stop for a moment, that is the traditional Passover Seder that Jesus, the disciples, and possibly the others uh, celebrated, was actually in process, in progress. The, the supper generally lasts several hours. It's not a quick eat. If you've ever done a Seder, it begins at sundown, so somewhere 6.30 to 7.30 in that range, depending on the, the time of year it, hit, it hits. But it continues on and may continue as late as midnight, and it never goes past midnight. Okay? Just remember that. If you ever go to a Seder, Seder and it's long, it's like, okay, we will get out of here by midnight because that's the, the absolute end. Now, the, the term that's used here for and translated as being ended is actually more often rendered to be or was happening or came to pass or it was being done. In other words, the supper had been prepared and then the Seder is now in progress. And I, I mention this because this actually becomes more significant uh, in this passage and as we go through the chapter. See, this, the supper, this Passover Seder supper has many levels of meaningful symbolism. And it's um, kind of an original multimedia, multi-sensory Passover Seder experience that's been repeated every year for thousands of years. It tells a story. It has, there are many blessings that are spoken that are significant in there. Uh, praise songs are sung, and of course a lot of food is eaten, and even four cups of wine are consumed throughout the evening. And, you know, the Bible tells us not to get drunk. So it wasn't in a manner that was, you know, rowdy drunkenness. It was just a long time that it was going on. Now, each, each family member participates at some parts during the celebration. I'd love to get into it, but that's not really where we're focused on as a Seder today. So, um, but as all these things come together, God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ is revealed to those who are open to him. And I, I believe Jesus during this time, um, he, I think he took the time to explain the deeper meanings to the disciples as this meal progressed. It doesn't say all that, but we see hints of that. Now, this night, it was no longer a traditional ritual like that had happened for many, many years. But everything was coming to life as the events that were foreshadowed in the, in the Seder and in the parts of the Seder in the blessings and in the symbolism and the things they ate and drank and the, these details, they were literally being fulfilled right in front of the disciples. So as we continue reading in verse 2, we see that not everybody's heart is focused on the meaning of the supper. And so what I'm going to do is just for a little clarity, the next uh, three verses, I'm going to read them in the Amplified uh, to bring out some clarity. Verse 2, it was during supper when the devil had already put the thought of betraying Jesus into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that Jesus, knowing that the Father had put everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was now returning to God, got up from supper, took off his outer robe, and taking a servant's towel, he tied it around his waist. And this was something really weird to do. Okay. If, you, if you hadn't figured that out already by their reactions. Uh, Jesus knew this was the last time that he'd be sharing a meal with his disciples. And the preparations had ended. The meal was in progress. And as he was doing these very specific meaning, things at, at meaningful times in the meal, um, 
we see that this event chronicled here takes place near the beginning of this Seder celebration, just after sundown, and it's what it's um, taking place in what's called the upper room. Now, if you've been to Israel, you probably have been either pointed to or been in the upper room that this took place at. Um, and it had already opened up. They'd already had about a half a glass of wine that had been drunk as, they, as it opened up. And then the leader called for everyone to go through orchas. Okay, that's a Hebrew word. And I, you know, cleared my throat while I was saying because that's kind of what it sounds like. Orchats, or the cleansing. And it was really a very simple hand washing before the eating began. And it wasn't even one where they had a blessing at. We'll see that if you go through the Seder, it's later on in the Seder. But it represented a spiritual cleansing by pouring water over the hands and drying them out with a special towel. And sometimes you helped others, you poured them over each other's hands and, and it was you know, kind of a cleansing time. The leader of the Seder, and in this case, probably Jesus, he called out the Orchats but then he surprised everyone when that was done by taking out his outer garment. There's this really fancy robe that they would wear. He took off his outer garment that the leader traditionally wore. He went over and he picked up the servant's towel that was over there. Now the towel was basically this, what a slave used. The slave really of the lowest order. And the disciples didn't understand what he was doing. It's like, you know, they'd already started the fellowship but there was something missing in this picture. See, Jesus observed something else that nobody else mentioned. Nobody had done what was customary for the evening meal, okay? They'd been, of course, they'd been walking out through various places through the day. Um, they more than likely had recently bathed as was normally done, you know, they were, they were clean, but remember, they wore sandals and they walked on dirt and dust path roads where animals were at and everyone's feet were dirty and nasty. And we're not sure. There could have been just Jesus and the disciples there, or there could have been other family and friends that were there. I believe it's probably some, some others that were there too. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci only painted the, uh, is it Leonardo da Vinci? Only painted 12 of them in the, in the scene. Uh, when I went down to Peru, uh, they had some artists there that uh, took a lot of liberties, and they had probably 50 people in the picture around there and, they, and on the table their main meal was guinea pig because that's a traditional Peruvian delicacy. And so people picture it in different ways, but you know, we know at least Jesus and the disciples were there. Uh, but we're not sure, but there was an oversight that had taken place. What wasn't there, there wasn't the lowest of the low servants. His job is to wash everybody's feet. And you know, they, everybody's supposed to be clean. They're clean all over except for their feet, which was nasty, and they're kind of reclining at the meal. They weren't sitting up in chairs, they were reclining, so their feet were probably near each other's faces, and uh, I can't imagine they didn't notice <laughs> that the feet were dirty. But, you know, you think, well, didn't somebody do it? Well, any of the disciples, I think any of them would have gladly asked, would have gladly washed Jesus' feet if he'd say, hey, you know, Peter, John, James, you know, could you come over? Could you wash my feet? Yeah, yes, yes, Lord, I'll do that. But if they had just volunteered to wash his feet to start with, it would seem like they were saying, I'm available to wash everyone else's feet too. And they were not interested in washing everybody else's feet. Yeah, you got to understand, Jesus, near the end of his ministry, He's talking about setting up a kingdom, you know, talking about the kingdom of God. And so you're wondering, what's the big deal here? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> because during the trip to Jerusalem a few days earlier, we, we see the mother of James and John. Uh, yes, the same John that wrote this. He tried, uh, she was trying to get Jesus to promise that her two sons would sit at Jesus' left hand and at his right hand. They'd be right next to him. So, Jesus, you know, can you, can you, let's, let's cut a deal here. Get my boys to sit next to you in your kingdom. <laughs> exactly what she did. It's a telling story in Matthew 20. Take a look at that a little bit later on. I encourage you to review that to see the whole picture. But to sum it up, it really caused a big stir among the disciples. And it wasn't because of what they had here, what mama had done. I'm sure James and John had probably put them up to it, put her up to it. Hey, can you ask for us? He'll get upset if we ask him. The other, but 
No, no. They all wanted to be in those positions. And they were all thinking, how am I going to get up into the, one of these top positions of being the top brass? And these two guys, uh, like I said, seemed to have put their mom up to asking him, and so they weren't real happy. But the key point in the, in the account in Matthew was not what happened, it was Jesus' response. And part of his response in uh, Matthew 20, 26 to 28, Jesus told them, whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So here we are just a week, less than a week later, here at the supper, and instead of practicing Jesus' teachings, you know, oh, you know, I'll, I'll go over and I'll, I'll act like a slave because I want to be great. They didn't do that. They were still competing for the top positions in the kingdom. Nobody wanted to be looked down as a servant, maybe a little weaker. And so what happened is that nobody's feet got washed. Jesus was looking around the room. The, they washed their hands. The water was there. There was a wash basin, foot washing basin there. Servant's towel was there. You know, everything's there and everybody's feet were still dirty. So we read in verse 5, After that, he, that's Jesus, poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So Jesus and the others were all ready to dig into the food. You know, the first, first part of the meal had some vegetables and they were dipped in salty water, which was going to be good. That was a good part of the meal. And, and uh, they got up to wash their hands. And now Jesus is getting his hands dirty with the yucky dirt and the manure and the rocks, anything else he might have to scrape off the disciples' feet at this point in the meal. Now remember John had said just a few verses earlier, having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. Now John was, he was young, but he was a, he was a pretty smart little guy <laughs> at this time. He's probably still a teenager when this happened, or early 20s at the latest. And while the next few verses focuses on Peter's reaction, I can imagine that John had a reaction here too. You know, we see he had a tender heart, and I, I, I can imagine that John was probably almost in tears, thinking, man, I just really missed what Jesus was trying to teach us. I don't know, you know. Remember John, you know, he was trying to get his mom to give him a big position, and Jesus said, hey, you want to be great? Serve, act like a slave. And so John's the only gospel writer that recounts this event, by the way. So, you know, that indicates to me the tenderness of his heart and, and how important it was to him and, and to convey this. And we, will, we have some great lessons to learn, too. And I think it just so deeply impacted his life to see how low that Jesus had to stoop to give his disciples an, an illustrated lesson about what he really clearly told them before. And you know, still some didn't get it. Um, verse 6, then he came to Simon Peter. He's going around. Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Or are you washing my feet? <laughs> it's like, you know. I'd say, well, who do you think it is? <laughs> but no, Peter knew it was out of place, similar to back when Jesus came to John the baptizer to be baptized. And, you know, he told Jesus, hey, this is backwards. You should be baptizing me. But then in verse 7, Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Now, we understand the parallel here, too. Okay, you look how Jesus got up. Jesus rose from his throne in heaven, a place of rest and comfort with a food from the table. He laid aside his glory, this outer garment, this beautiful outer garment that as the leader of the Seder he took off, but he left, laid aside his glory, taking his heavenly clothing off to, to come to earth. He took a towel and girded around himself, basically took on the form of a servant when he came to be with us. You see the parallels to his whole life and what he had done? And, and then he, he was ready to work. He poured water into a basin, ready to clean the dirt off their feet. And we know it's just like he poured his blood out to cleanse us from the guilt and penalty of sin. What a great picture. I mean, this is just, just a beautiful picture. But back to Peter. You know, by this point, he and really all the disciples were pretty much aware that Jesus was in danger. Okay, he was a little jumpy, you know. He was uptight. They feared fear that Jesus' death you know, may, well, not only take their Messiah away from them, because Jesus had kept talking about how it's time for him to die. 
but it also put them in imminent danger as well. So, you know, it's in times like these when it would have been good for Peter to remember the words that Jesus had spoken earlier. Back in Matthew 11, 28 to 29, Jesus said, Come to me, speaking to the whole crowd, including the disciples. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, Peter was telling Jesus in this verse, be patient. You know, you're kind of uptight, you're burdened, but you don't understand now, but you'll be learning from me, and you'll understand this later on. And um, Of course, Peter, you know, he knew better than Jesus, though. So, you know, he's, he's trying to say, Jesus is saying, you'll understand. And Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. That's verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Okay. Now, unlike us today, Peter was, you know, he saw the Lord at work and he started telling Jesus how to do it, what to do and what he was going to do. Right. I mean, we would never ask the Lord to do something and to do it our way, would we? You've never done that, have you, brother? Of course not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you God, help me get out of this financial mess I got myself into. And, and here's how I want you to do it. Um, and then we proceed to give God his plan for us. Uh, it reminds me, a few years ago, I, I was on a nationwide prayer phone line. People from anywhere in the country could call in. And, and I'm not sure if this guy always called, I mean, only called at 4.15 on Friday afternoons. That was during my shift. But... Um, I don't, he may have called every all the time, all through the day and night, too. I don't know. But I could count on getting a call from a guy named John. Interesting. But his request was always the same. Mitzi, you know who this is going to be. Pray that God will help me win the lottery. And, you know, the line was for us to pray. It wasn't for us to preach. But, you know, I'd always recap something back to them that I could pray about. You know, so I'd say, oh, thank you, John. I understand you want me to pray for God to bless you financially. And he'd say, no, I want you to pray that God will help me win the lottery. Week after week after week. And, of course, all the only thing I could do was pray for this, this friend uh, that I had made. And, and so, of course, I would counsel with my prayers. Y'all ever have that happen to you? You know, someone's praying for you and, you know, counseling comes out of that prayer. <laughs> so, I'd counsel in my prayers. I prayed to God to bless him as he was growing spiritually, as he was faithful in handling his finances in a godly manner, and among other things, I would pray for John. Uh, and, and usually he'd get a little upset with me. He kept calling, but you know, he, he'd say, I told you to pray that I win the lottery. <laughs> he'd say many, many times. But John, you know, John never did call and say, Praise God, I'd won the lottery, and I'd give God the glory for it, and I'll trust him, and I, I'm getting closer to God. And and um, no, he, that didn't happen, you know. So that's just a little illustration of Peter. You shall never wash my feet. No, no, this is not the way it's going to work, Jesus. Uh, obviously, Peter was kind of the same way. He didn't understand what Jesus was trying to teach him or why Jesus wanted to wash his feet. And he was getting um, so upset and a little belligerent at Jesus. So, so Jesus jumped right back in and said, began to explain to Peter a little more. Continuing verse 8, Jesus answered him, yeah, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Ooh, 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 ooh. Suddenly it's changing, right? Peter, already we'd seen he gone out and preached the good news of the kingdom. He cast out devils in Jesus' name during the ministry. Um, but Jesus still needed to wash his feet. Peter had seen Jesus transfigured on his glory, together with Moses and Elijah, an amazing spiritual experience, and he still needed Jesus to wash his feet. Peter's own feet walked on water in an amazing act of faith that Peter had to, to go out to Jesus. And yes, guess what? He still needed Jesus to wash his feet. This foot washing was such a powerful lesson in humility, but it was more than that. It also shows us that Jesus has no fellowship, no deep connection with those who have not been cleansed by him. And having a part with Jesus simply... You know, it begins simply with just receiving something from him, not by achieving something ourselves. It's nothing that we do. We just accept that, what he's offering. Now, who is it that's doing the cleansing here in this picture, in this little story? Yes, Jesus. He's doing the cleaning. This is one of the hardest things. I, I tell you, brothers and sisters, it's one of the hardest things for people to understand is that once they realize how much God loves them, 
once they realize how much they fall short of, of his standards and his glory and how sinful they really are, many don't think they can ever clean themselves up enough to be worthy enough to have a part with the Lord. And you know what? They can't do it. They're right. We can't do it. I can't do it. Only Jesus can cleanse us. And we need to let him do it. So then, then we see Simon Peter takes another jump back, another position. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, I'm going to say again, you know, he's, he's interrupting. He's still interrupting Jesus to correct him. Okay? <laughs> so he's going he's to correct him here in verse 9. But uh, yeah, he's a little worried, uptight, a little excitable. But there is a life lesson for us as we're in the middle of this interruption. The life lesson is when God is trying to tell you something, don't interrupt him with your own ideas. Be still and listen to him. When God is trying to tell you something, don't interrupt with your own ideas. Be still and listen to him. So let's keep going and see what happens. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. <laughs> you see, that's quite a quick and dramatic change from, you'll never wash my feet. <laughs> well, at least he's not saying, no, Lord, <laughs> like we'd seen him do before. It's more like, sure, let's do it. Let's go all out for this. I'm all in. And, you know, I just, I'm reading this and I'm just saying, okay, Peter, let Jesus finish what he's trying to say before you embarrass yourself even more. <laughs> you know, I think Peter was probably the last one to have his feet washed in here. Uh, may not have been, but I kind of I get that impression because I think at first the disciples were shocked as he was doing this and they probably pulled back a little and then, you know, he just kind of, no, no, let me do this. And, and um, then many of them realized how, and especially John, how, how humbling, how humbling this experience was. And he showed them, illustrating what he had done earlier. But our, our friend Peter, yeah, fire, aim, ready? Peter, <laughs> that's a nickname for him there. Fire, aim, ready. Peter was wondering why the other guys just let Jesus do this for them. He wasn't going to have that happen. And, uh, and so we see him changing his tune. And and finally, in verse 10, Jesus says to him, said to him, He who is bathed only needs to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Who? Oh. <laughs> kind of a little stinger at the end. We'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus is saying as we walk through this path in the world, as believers, as people who have been forgiven, as people who have turned our life over to Jesus, we still might pick up a little dirt just from walking around in it. Okay, you, you can't keep the dirt from hitting you, from getting on your feet. But that defilement is only surface. It's not in your head, it's not in your mind, it's not in your heart. It's just on the feet. As long as your feet are washed, that's all you need. Your heart's already clean. And, and we face it, all this stuff walking through the world. It's, it's good sometimes just to come in and to sit here in the presence of the Lord to hear the word of God spoken. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So now we just let the word of God wash us and we feel that cleansing of God's word as we gather together. And there's a passage that's a little odd to, to read by itself unless you understand what happened here. And I'm so glad that John put this account in, in his gospel because it says in Ephesians 5, 25 to 26, it reminds us about this parallel between washing with water and washing with the Word of God. And it's talking to husbands uh, about their wives, but it, it also it, it tells an illustration. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And the important part is that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word. And just by itself, that didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Washing of water by the word, what is that? But here the connection is made between the great love of Christ that he showed him, that showed itself in that servant leadership that he took as he washed the disciples' feet and the way that our lives are cleansed as we deeply immerse ourselves in the word of God. So it's just a, a beautiful picture again and, and it brings, it shows how his, um, his holiness and completion is brought to our lives. Nothing we can do to make that happen as Christ loved us so are we able to show that same love and, and show and, and be of service to others. It brings us all to a fuller relationship with God. So, you know, that, that is really good application. So 
praise the Lord. But, you know, there, there's even more here. Okay, it's something just a little bit deeper. Jesus said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. Hey, think about that. God, I've seen people that are, have felt so convicted of, of sin, they went back over and over and asking God to forgive them of things that they'd already been forgiven for. And, you know, I can see God in heaven when they're asking for forgiveness. It's like, uh, what are you talking about? Because God forgives and forgets. It's gone from their lives. No, no need to do that again. But, you know, once you're following Christ and your sins have been forgiven and you have eternal life, you don't need to go back and do get all cleaned up all over again every time you find some more dirt on your feet or a little bit of sin in your life. Now, I'm not minimizing sin, okay? Don't get, don't get me wrong here. But when, there's, when you've uh, identified some sin in your life, a place where you've fallen short of God's glory, of God's best, uh, just come to Jesus and let him clean you up. You know, let him clean that little, that little bit, that lesser amount off, okay? You, you have it. You know, he's, he's not dangling you over hell, saying, okay, one sin, I'm going to cut the cord. No, that's not the way God works, okay? He wants to forgive your sins. He wants you to come and, and keep that relationship going and fresh. And so let them clean you up. But at the same time, um, don't expect, okay? On the other hand, don't expect that it's a, uh, you know, to be washed one time. Hey, you're forgiven. You said a prayer. It's a one and done deal, okay? Now you don't have to do anything else. <laughs> that doesn't, that's not the way it works either. That's what Jesus is saying here. He who is bathed needs. He didn't say he who is bathed doesn't have to wash his feet anymore but that he needs to wash off. 1 John 1, 8 to 9, of course, tell us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, that wasn't written to unbelievers, okay? That was written to brothers and sisters in the Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can't help but think that John is thinking back to this phrase that Jesus said, who, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. You're, you're a believer. Don't say you haven't sinned. Just let Jesus wash that off of you when it happens. Our life lesson is keep your relationship with Jesus current. Keep your heart clean and then ask for forgiveness when you need to. Keep your relationship with Jesus current. Keep your heart clean and then ask for forgiveness when you need to. I think that's pretty common sense. It's a key to a victorious life with Jesus. So as Jesus explained this, he, he says something that they weren't really expecting. And uh, he says, but not all of you. And it was explained in verse 11, it says, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Uh, yes, he went there. Okay. <laughs> he throws that out. And then what? Um, he doesn't say anything else for a while about it. Okay, and we're not even going to get that to the next teaching. But, uh, you know, the disciples heard that as like they start some interesting reaction from the disciples. They start looking around. Okay, who, who's this rascal Jesus is talking about? You know, they're looking around. Who, who is this? That's a common reaction. Don't tell me you hadn't acted that way. You're in a group of people and the leader says, somebody in this group here is in big trouble. Okay, what's our first thing? What did Mitzi do now? Oh, I bet it's Tom again. I was always wondering about Tom. What what Tom do? And then the subject changes, and it's like, he's not going to say? You know, and you're still wondering. Then the thought comes to you, oh, hold it. Maybe, maybe it was me. What did I do? And, you know, I, that never happens to y'all, but, you know. Um, I, I, I heard, don't do this, Mitzi. I heard one of the, one of the worst things uh, that a, a wife can do to her husband is say, I found out what you did and you're in trouble. Not having anything in mind, just doing that and just watching the guy's reaction, okay? <laughs> you're like, starting to think, what did I do? What did I do? You know? But anyway, the subject changes. You're still wondering, what did I do or who did it? So again, we'll explore this all in the next teaching. I'm going to leave you hanging there, but this time for another life lesson from, from what's happening right here. And that is when there's a problem in the room, don't look for someone else to blame it on. Examine your own heart first. When there's a problem in the room, don't look for someone else to blame it on. Examine your own heart first. So in our text today, Jesus has left the idea that someone in the room is dirty, just hanging. He moves on to a, a really plain explanation of what he had just done, what had just happened. 
And that is in verses 12 to 17, and we're gonna wrap it up with this. Um, a lot of verses because I get so very clear. Verse 12, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent, who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Wow, well, it's very clear. Of course, you know, back in those days, serving another person was demonstrated by washing their feet. That was the lowest form of the servant. We don't live in the days of the slavery anymore. Um, nor do we generally walk on dirt roads all day with open sandals. Okay, So washing a person's feet when they come into your home or when you go into your own home is, you know, that, that's not typically a practice here in our culture. You know, you might better fill the, ro the role by going over and mowing your neighbor's lawn or washing your windows or washing out a brother's garbage pail, you know, when it gets smelly or maybe cleaning his toilet or you know, maybe you could dump his RV's black water tank when, uh, you know, it seems to be an issue. So the attitude here is that I'm not so great that I cannot serve your needs. Okay, that's the attitude that Jesus has taught you. Very plain, very simple. All of this to say that, okay? I'm not so great that I can't serve your needs and I should be willing to take the place of a servant to serve my brothers for the Lord's sake. I'm not too big to serve you. So that's, that's it. And you know, sometimes it's really easy for us to criticize uh, those that have dirty feet <laughs> or smelly toilets um, instead of just washing them for them. And we wonder, we talk about what a mess they make out of their lives or how terrible that person must be living. Just look at them, look how dirty they are. Look at the effects of sin over his life. Brothers and sisters, that's the world's way. You know, and Christ's way is very different. He says nothing, he grabs the towel. He takes the basin, he fills it with water. He begins washing away the stains. And Jesus is telling us today, no task is beneath you. Serve one another. Take the attitude of servants towards one another. Be willing to give of yourself to serve another person's need. Don't live on a pedestal. You don't live on a pedestal, okay? Don't even try to exalt yourself. Um, don't get so high up that you demand that people serve you. Okay? Jesus is saying, I set the example for you here. The example to take the place of a servant. Yes, I'm saying it over and over again. Why? Because we need to hear it over and I need to hear it over and over again. You know, not even, an, you know, not even that of an upper level servant. Oh, I'm the best servant in the house. Okay, that's not the one we're talking about. No, I'm, a, I'm just a regular servant. No, not that one. We're talking about the lowest servant of the lowest part of the house. Like if that's the one that gets to wash the feet. Get out, serve the needs of, of the world wherever they are, whatever they are. And yes, we need more brothers and sisters that are servants. We need more leaders that are servants. They're the true ministers of Jesus Christ. Uh, just a quick story. Years ago, I arranged for a group of, of leaders from a group around the state to have a meeting, top leaders in our state, in our, in our room in our church for an hour or two. As everyone was getting settled down, it was almost time to start. Uh, a scruffy dressed younger guy came in pushing a cart. Uh, it was stocked with coffee and soft drinks and snacks and water and and he said something like, oh, it's good to see you all here. Take whatever you want and have a great meeting. Then let me know if you need anything else. They thanked him, and as he started walking towards the door, some of the guys started asking me, you know, did, if I had arranged that for him, oh, Bob, you got somebody to do this for us? I was like, no. Actually, I wish I had, but I'd like to introduce to you my pastor, David McGee. <laughs> it was the senior pastor of a good, large congregation. And decades later now, uh, over a decade later, these men still fondly talk about my pastor and what he did that day because of his servant leadership. And um, I, I think I know that knew that day a little bit about how Peter felt. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, okay, now I'm now I'm getting it. Okay, I should have been doing this all along. I should have washed everybody else's feet. And I'm sure they all felt that at the end of the meal or at the end of the, that illustration. That wasn't the end of the meal. We're going to touch on some more of that, but. Remember, Jesus said here, if you know these things, blessed are you. He didn't stop there, did he? 
What do you say? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Not if, just if you know them. And I'm thankful John wrote about the event, brought it to us again. James 1.22 reinforces it. A little later on in the scripture says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. The joy of serving one another in the body of Christ is a joy indeed. And I uh, just want to encourage each of you and me as well to be doers of the word of God. Y'all have a great day.